Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia dominates the Arabian Peninsula in the Middle East area of West Asia. Pencil. We have a border up here with Jordan. There's a border with Iraq and a border with Kuwait. A little bitty border here with Qatar. And there is a land bridge to a land bridge, just a bridge to Bahrain. So not technically a border, but they have access to it. We have a border with the United Arab Emirates, with Oman and Yemen. And then the only other borders are against the water. We have the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, depending on whatever place you're from, how you refer to it as. We're not going to get into that. So Saudi Arabia has many different geographic areas. I know a lot of people just think it's sand, and it definitely does have a lot of sand. But there's a lot more regions to it than you think. We're going to start up here in the north area. This mountainous area up here is known as the Hejaz. And it is very rocky, dry, mountainy. It does have that wonderful Red Sea coastline, but it's not like, like the Riviera or anything. It's a coastline though, nonetheless. This area is very famous for the cities of Mecca, of Medina, and Jeddah. Mecca being the holiest site in the religion of Islam. You can see the Kaaba shrine over here in the heart of Mecca is by far the most holy place to Muslims. Medina would be place number two, and there are regular pilgrimages back and forth, part of the Hajj Pyramid. Pyramid? Wow. Pilgrimage. I'm going too fast. I'm excited. Saudi Arabia is a new place. It's time to calm down. A part of the pilgrimage is traveling to Medina for the Hajj. Jeddah is seen as the access point to Mecca since they don't allow airplanes or airports there, which makes a lot of sense because it's a very religiously important city. So you really don't want to taint it with things that are too modern, you know. So you fly into Jeddah and then travel to Mecca. Let's see, next we have the Asir, which is this region down here. This is where the mountains get very, very mountainy, huge, craggy rocks. The, like literal mountains this time. This is more like huge craggy rocks. This is mountains. This is where it gets seriously mountainous. The coastline here is a lot more coasty. <laughs> it's known as the Tiam, and it is very fertile. There's lots of water coming off the mountains here. There's even some snow sometimes, and it makes this land here very fertile. So it's a farming area mainly things like dates and other kind of tropical-ish <laughs> crops. Let's see, next let's head back over here. The central area in general is known as Nasht. It's very ancient traditional name. That means plateau in Arabic, apparently. The Jabal Tuaik dominates this area. Another little rocky outcropping that makes this interesting arc pattern. And right here within it is the city of Riyadh, the capital city. For the most part though, the Najd is just very dry, uh, rocky, not quite sandy like these other areas. The Nafud up here, the northern area, is very dry and sandy, very deserty. Same sort of with the Adana over here. It is a little different though, because this is where all the oil is. The largest oil reserves in the world are in this area. So a lot happens here on the coast to import and export. Then there's this section down here, the Rubal Kali, the empty quarter. And just as it says, there is nothing here, as you can see. It is sand as far as the eye can see, and even further than that. 
it extends into the UAE, Oman, and Yemen. It's absolutely huge. It's the largest stretch of sand in the world. And interestingly, in the more recent news, apparently the government wants to build a like luxury eco-housing complex in the empty quarter because there are plans to slowly try to build up in it even though the sand is very fine and hot and you can't really build on fine hot sand but they want to create this community that's totally self-sufficient and totally 100% green and it's like you know that's a nice that's a nice thought that's a good thing um, but who's gonna move there <laughs> You need people who are willing to relocate their entire lives to live in an absolutely barren desert for an experiment? I, I don't know. I think it's just a, a puff piece kind of news idea, but we'll have to see, I suppose. There's a lot of projects in Saudi Arabia that had these grand plans and just never happened. Most famously, the Jeddah Tower, which is planned to be the tallest building in the world after the Burj Khalifa. Well, taller than the Burj Khalifa. The whole point is to try to beat the Burj Khalifa, but so many things have happened and it's been held up and it's like not even like a fourth of the way constructed. It's just sitting there slightly abandoned. So that is Saudi Arabia in a nutshell. It is the largest country without any rivers. There are wadis though, and you can see little wadis here and there on this map and wadis are temporary rivers so only when there's rain the wadis will fill up with water create a river and it will slowly dry up there are also a lot of oases throughout saudi arabia anytime you see like a random spot in the desert that's an oasis town najran's a big one down here so let's get into the history of saudi arabia because it's very different from all the other Middle Eastern countries, especially the ones I've already covered, which I think this is the last one that I... I'm pretty sure this is the last Middle Eastern country that I get to explore, so let's get into it. There have been ancient people in this area forever, it's mainly in the Hejaz area up here, Tabuk being one of the more old ancient towns of Saudi Arabia. It's believed that dog domestication might have occurred in this area here, and it's possible that the Mesopotamian culture sort of like overlapped into this area and influenced each other. The Saluki dog, by the way, was believed to be the, the breed domesticated and bred in this area. The Dilmun culture existed over here as well, kind of in this area. I believe, because they would eventually move to Bahrain over here. There's also the uh, Medians, who are also up in this area, mentioned in the Bible. And the Nabataeans also came into the area here. They were famous for being in Jordan, that's where Petra, their big city is, but they also built lots of rock cities in what's now Saudi Arabia. Eventually, though, further down the line of history, in about the year 571 CE, a man who came to be known as Muhammad was born in Mecca and, in a nutshell, created the religion of Islam. And this religion took off in Saudi Arabia. We're not going to really get into the history of Islam, other than um, Muhammad was born here, he received revelations from the angel Gabriel, he tried to spread it, the people said, get out, so he moved to Medina, the people here believed him, started an army, they went back and conquered Mecca, and from there started to spread throughout the Arabian Peninsula, and up north into the Levant region as well, until he passed away. And then the spread happened dramatically, it spread all throughout the Middle East, Northern Africa, even up into Spain, up into Western Asia, Central Asia, all over the place, Eastern Europe, it was, it was all over the place. And the big dynasties to come out of the Arab Muslims would have been first the Umayyad, which was the first big, big Muslim empire, I suppose. 
Um, those are the ones who invaded Spain, the, the Moors, you know, were part of the Umayyad Caliphate. The Abbasids would have come out next. They ruled from Baghdad up here in what's now Iraq, but um, were Arab nonetheless. There was also the Fatimid dynasty, which was a branch of Shia Islam. The biggest deviation from the like very first form of Islam, even though the Shias consider it to be the best form of Islam, but we're not going to get into that. I'm not Muslim. I've never read the Quran. It's not in my place to talk about. Really interestingly, in the eastern half of Saudi Arabia, there were their own cultures and dynasties popping up over there, mainly the uh, Kamarsians. I believe that's how they were pronounced. I forgot. I was reading about them, I think, when I was doing research on Bahrain or Qatar. But they were wild in that they attacked Medina and stole the black stone out of the Kaaba. Like the most sacred part of the most sacred shrine in the most sacred city like that's that's pretty that's pretty gutsy but there are various other dynasties this area would come to be conquered by the ottoman empire first before the rest of saudi arabia would fall under the ottoman sphere of influence the ottoman empire being a muslim empire up in what was constantinople when the ottomans took it over they renamed it to istanbul and established the Ottoman Empire, which also swept through the area and created a massive, a true empire, this time not a caliphate, not a sheikhdom, an empire. So slowly but surely they made their way down the peninsula and, you know, controlled the area. Their argument being they needed to preserve Mecca just in case anyone else tried to come and steal the black stone from the Kaaba. That's still like wild to me. Like why would anyone, anyway? Um, that, that was what they claimed, was that they were controlling the area just to make sure that Mecca was maintained and preserved and that pilgrimages were still happening. So they say. It's, it was definitely a power dynamic kind of thing. Mecca has always just been ruled by the, the people of Mecca. The rulers of Mecca have always been the rulers of Mecca and only the rulers of Mecca who just do their own thing. They have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um... In this day and age, you know, billions of Muslims migrate, migrate. Why am I messing up the word pilgrimage twice in this video? They um, do the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca every year. So it's, it's a lot to maintain. Let's see. So, yes, by the 16th century, I should say, they controlled the Hejaz area, Asir, and the al Asa area. In 1727, in Najd, I believe in what's now Riyadh, a prince named Muhammad bin Saud met up with a priest, a priest, uh, a preacher. I'm not sure what he, like what official title. Muhammad bin Abd Wahhabi, of the creator of Wahhabism, another branch of Islam. A very conservative branch of Islam believed that all of these modern vanities were just straying too far from the path and that people needed to be far more intensely conservative. Um, the, the Prince Mohammed bin Saud thought that this was a great idea. He teamed up with this man to form an alliance. They created a complex called Duraya, and which is still there today. It's in ruins, but it's a very beautiful place to tour. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they set out to conquer the peninsula. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little hiccup. They set out to conquer the peninsula, but the Ottomans stopped them in their tracks. Round two would occur in 1824 in Riyadh, centered here. The Saudis and um, various Wahhabi groups would conquer even further. They would actually make it to Mecca and started to take over the area until the Ottomans stopped them again and the family was kicked out and sent to Kuwait. Round three wouldn't happen until right around the beginning of World War I. This time they had the influence of the British who had plenty of influence up in this area, the Middle East, in Iraq, Iran, Kuwait. A man who came to be known as Lawrence of Arabia helped them out to defeat the Ottomans who were the enemies of the British during World War I. 
And they did just that. Abdulaziz ibn Saud became the ruler of the Hejaz region. And on September 23rd, 1932, he reunited with the Najd region and created the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which lines we see today drawn up then. In 1941, oil was discovered, changed everything completely. The Saudis teamed up with the United States to create a company known as Aramco. And it's the most profitable oil company in the world right now. And uh, it's brought so much wealth to Saudi Arabia and the Saudi royal family and the Saudi people in general, but mainly the Saudi royal family are crazy rich off of oil money. They pretty much control the oil industry, like the global oil industry. For example, in 1971, when there were, how do I put this, like, um, disappointment over what was happening in Israel with other countries supporting or not enough not supporting, they decided to restrict their oil exports, which drove up the price of oil, which made them incredibly rich. And they can sort of dangle that little thread of economy over the world and have their way however they want. A lot of Saudis were not happy about this, though. They did not like how they had such close relations with the West, and that would create a lot of, let's say, bad guys. <laughs> For the sake of YouTube, not wanting to demonetize me. Bad guys who would do bad things, mainly at very bad events that would happen on American soil in the Gulf of Aden. Um, you know, I, I think you know what I'm trying to say without saying it. It's still sort of a problem today, but I don't think nearly as much like it was back in the early 2000s. I think the Americans kind of saw to that with what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2011, the Arab Spring protests reached Saudi Arabia. The rulers here were like, well, you know, we hear you. There are some countries that have had massive success with the Arab Spring. There are some that have had disasters, so we'll just do this. We will send more money toward the actual people of Saudi Arabia. We're going to give women more rights, since part of Wahhabism is to restrict women as much as possible for a term, for, for the sake of um, just preservation, I suppose decency, modesty, things like that. So, anyway, that's pretty much where Saudi Arabia is today, in a nutshell. Whew, I summed that up too fast again, kind of like I did with Egypt, but um, it's a difficult subject to talk about because there's a lot of contentious things. There's some things that I omitted for the sake of YouTube, not wanting to partially demonetize or restrict this video. If you know, you know, mainly about a, a certain journalist who was here, you know, we're, we're not going to get into it. And the various um, corruption of the crown prince, we're not getting into it. Not in this video. This is a relaxation video. I'm here to t teach you the history of Saudi Arabia, not the history of controversies in Saudi Arabia. Let's put it that way. Let's flip through the book. And look at some pictures of Saudi Arabia. Here we can see, when I tell you the pilgrimage, nailed it. The pilgrimage to Mecca is massive. It is so massive. I had a friend who went in um, 2018, I want to say. Look at these domes, how beautiful. But it's not like you can be like, oh, how was it? Because it's not a vacation. It's a very handsome face there. It's a pilgrimage, right? So I couldn't be like, how to go? <laughs> it was just, oh, I'm so glad you got to go. And she had a fantastic time, I should say. She was, she loved it. Mainly, I should say, <laughs> this is so bad. She's one of my Pokemon Go friends. I don't think she plays anymore, but we did back in that time. I still play. And um, at that time, there was a Pokemon that was only available in the Middle East. And she was like, I want so bad to take out my phone and try to find this Pokemon, but, um, no. <laughs> but, um, 
obviously she didn't. I don't even know if that game even works in Mega, probably not. Anyway, this is the Kingdom, um, the Kingdom Center in Riyadh. It looks like um, Sauron in Mordor to me. Um, I'm sure that was not the intention, but that's all I can see when I look at this building. Here's a map of Saudi Arabia, so it's located in the world. And here is Abd al Aziz, who united Saudi Arabia. And there's the, the Kaaba in Mecca, and people have to walk around it, and there's so many different little ceremonial things that go over various days for the Hajj. Some women here taking photos of something, but this is to demonstrate how most women dress in Saudi Arabia because it's a religious thing. The rocks here, let's see, this is, this is Tabuk. So, rocky rocks, right? <laughs> Here's the physical map of Saudi Arabia and the water there. I think that's the Red Sea? I'm not sure. Lots of camels. And this is um, up Jabal Sauda, which is about right here near Amba, the highest point in Saudi Arabia. Let's see, this is in Asir. Very beautiful area, isn't it? And there's an oasis here, a date palm farm. And this is in the Nafud sand and rocks. And that's pretty much it. It says it seldom rains more than twice a year. Air pollution being a big problem in an oil country. And some of the amazing sandstone caves that the Nabataeans really loved to carve into because it's a very soft rock and it's very beautiful. See, this is the city of Damam on the Persian Gulf. Right, it's not on my map. No, no, there it is, Damam. And the Rubakali. See, this is where they want to build a whole community. I don't know how they're going to manage that. But the plan is set, apparently. An old historic site here. Looks like this was a big part of a tower, maybe even a huge well. No, it was a well. Nailed it. And like I said, sometimes it does snow up in the mountains. The Jetta flood of 2009. It happens when you're a coastal lowland city. Up here we have the big clock tower in Mecca. And down here this must be uh, Medina. Yes, Medina. The big green dome. How beautiful. The Nubian Ibex. Oh wow, a baboon. <laughs> and a cute little gecko. And traditional camel country here. And a sweet turtle down here in the coral reefs of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. A little awu, <laughs> very cute. And more beautiful, beautiful coral reefs. Oh wow, locusts. That's a problem, isn't it? And dates here, growing on the date palm tree. And beautiful aloe plant. The stone carvings of the more ancient peoples of this area are so interesting. You can't see his little face because of the text here, but they are very like round. And they had lots of features on their bodies and then these little tiny faces. I like them. A very ancient saddle. It says it's from 500 BCE. Definitely for a camel, isn't it? Um, the uh, Marib Dam, which is now in Yemen, but it was a part of this culture's history. The early kingdoms. We have the Sabaeans down here in what's now Yemen. That's where the Marib Dam was. The Nabataeans, and then various other kingdoms. And this is some of their city rock carvings. Isn't that beautiful? Petra's just a very famous one because it's massive and it's gorgeous, but these are here as well. Look at this old depiction of the Kaaba in Mecca. It, it's, that 
it's dead on the little wall and everything it's really neat the spread of Islam you can see just how far this religion spread by the year 750 this is from the opposite era it says it's a little prayer and really neat drawing I like the camels oh, their necks are the same I like that this is Diraya, that um, city I told you about, that the Saudis founded. There is their territory, and here you can see is where the Ottomans occupied. And that's where the British were. And let's see, the Wahhabis fighting the Ottomans. And Abd al-Aziz. Um, I'm sure Lawrence of Arabia is in there somewhere, ready to take on the Ottomans. Uh, King Fahd was the king when this book came out. Yeah, he probably passed away like a few months after this book came out. So, um, we'll see the reigning king in a minute. This is after one of those very bad people I talked about did something very bad to an American apartment building. There was the King Abdullah. There he is again. And this is um, Salman bin Abdulaziz, who's the current king. Let's see. The Grand Mufti, Saudi Arabia, religious leader. And here's the flag. Let's break it down. There's not much to break down, but important things nonetheless. The emerald green flag of Saudi Arabia is inscribed with the Shahada, the Islamic Declaration of Faith. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Beneath the inscription is a saber, a curved blade sword. The green of the flag is the traditional color of Islam, and the saber represents the military strength of Saudi Arabia. The Al Saud dynasty has traditionally held close ties to the Wahhabi religious movement. The Wahhabis had used the Shahada on their flag since the 18th century. In 1902, Abd al-Aziz added a sword to the flag when he became king of Najd. The current flag was adopted in 1973. And let's see the consultative council. Because, you know, you have the king. And then the rest is sign of, of advice, right? Let's see, this guy is voting, it looks like. He's got a friend there helping to cast his ballot. The various provinces of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> a sweet being very proud. And let's see, selling dates in front of the court building. You can buy a snack before you go to your trial, I suppose. Police officers here. Looks like they're doing um, road management, like traffic management. And Riyadh has lots of very big modern skyscrapers nowadays. Here's a little map. Let's take a look. Let's see what we can see. The palace and museums, parks, and cultural centers of all kinds. Let's see if there's the big air base. And of course, like it says, oil is king. I mean, they have a king, but pipelines here, going to these big ships here. Their currency, they use the Rial. Let's see, what are they doing? They're processing olives in a factory. That's interesting, isn't it? Resources map, you can see all the oil over here. Various crops grown out here, and lots of, um, let's see, of cement. I thought I was going to say camels. That's camels. <laughs> See, making some use of the wadis there to irrigate. Some more date palms. And the dates in the big date palm tree. And a wheat field here. The King Foud Causeway that links to Bahrain. And let's see, this is in the airport very busy day and very busy shipping day as well in Jeddah and 
This is playing the satellite? Okay. Oh my gosh, stop. How sweet. <laughs> what a cute little... His shirt just says, boy. Maybe he's celebrating a brother. <laughs> Population density map, you can see it's not a very dense country at all. It's really concentrated in this area and then around the capital. I mean, when you've got all that sand, then reading the newspaper at the, the cafe, having some fancy drinks, and working hard in school, and working hard at university, it looks like. Graphic design, nice. Ooh, having a very deep meditative prayer. If I can turn the page. Another very deep meditative prayer during Ashura, a uh, Shia holiday of mourning. The Quran, very beautiful script in this one. I mean, they're all beautiful, but I like that. Usually it's all very decorated and beautiful. This one's very plain compared to those, but there's something very nice about the simplicity. The Grand Mosque of Mecca, at least the minarets of it. And this is a mosque in Medina, having some reading time. <laughs> the Quran. And let's see, the Grand Mosque here once again. A huge complex. And this is about um, praying toward Mecca and the Hajj and all of that. And <laughs> She's doing the hash. She's doing this thing that they do near Medina where there are these stone pillars that represent the devil and you throw rocks at him. So she's throwing her rocks. Eating in the evening of Ramadan. Oh my gosh, how beautiful. So many like gold teapots and accessories and things and even cool swords, goblets and stuff. Wow. They're at an art gallery discussing this beautiful piece of art. The National Museum. Abd al Rahman Munif, the famous author. They're doing this really cool traditional dance and playing the, let's see, Rababa. Very ancient looking instrument. And here's the dogs I mentioned, the Saluki dogs. Very cute. Oh, wow. Horse training. That's really neat. And, um, when, which Olympics was this? 2012, when they allowed female athletes to compete. Oh, wow. Beautiful. This is in the Najran, and it's very nice. See, this is showing the um, thaub, traditional men's clothing, and this lady shopping for some gorgeous dresses, my goodness. And this talks about how there's a level of the mall that's just for women, so they can be more relaxed and not as covered up. Gorgeous wedding dress there, isn't that beautiful? And they're out on their ATVs, having fun. An eye doctor checking this guy's eyes here. And he's making some bread at the market. It says, how nice. Fresh, fresh bread is the best bread. It doesn't matter what kind of bread. The fresh, 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 fresh bread. Best bread. Kabsa here. Looks really delicious. I'm getting hungry. Traditional teapots there. Drinking tea. Oh boy. Basbusa looks really sweet, but I'm sure it's very good. How cute this must be for Eid. Yeah, Eid al-Fitr. Because that's when you dress up in your very, very best. And celebrating National Day. No, that's not the end. Oh, it is the end. Never mind. All right, then. Well, that is it for Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.